I'm Zachary Moses with HE Travel, and I'm here talking to Dr. Dave Vaughn. Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah. Actually, honored to be the uh, executive director of Moots Tropical Research Lab in the Florida Keys, and that's a laboratory that uh, works on coral reefs. But uh, we are the field station that deals with coral reefs, and specifically, we've tailored reef restoration, which is a whole new term today. We started with getting one of every one of the species, sort of Noah's Ark of the corals, and bringing those corals into the laboratory to give them their own aquarium safe and sound. So if, heaven forbid, they went extinct in the wild, we would have some living tissue, just like a, a zoo would have a couple of pandas and trying to make sure the pandas did not go extinct. When you're dealing with corals that way, like if you're dealing with trees, you can just, you get seeds and you can put them in a drawer. How do you store your Noah's Ark of coral? Uh, actually, it just looked like a, a large aquarium that you might find in a restaurant or somebody's home. And we would have PVC racks that we just set them on like books. And with lights coming down, they had these shelves, so they, they each got enough light to be able to grow. But the biggest uh, uh, jump was when we learned that if you cut them into tiny, tiny pieces, something stimulates them to grow very, very fast. So this was a, a breakthrough that actually was caused by a breakage. <laughs> and. Uh, um, Sometimes uh, your biggest uh, advancements are your biggest mistakes, and this was one of those times. And how did you do that? How did you dis how, what was the mistake you made? Well, we decided we, about 11 years ago that we wanted to try to see if we could collect the naturally spawned eggs and sperm that were produced by corals once a year at the chance that one in a million might make it and form a new offspring. It's actually a free-swimming larvae of a coral. Swims around and finds a spot to settle down to. And uh, what we discovered is that out of a million eggs, uh, instead of one in a million making it every hundred years, our first try, we got 10 or 11 to make it. And we were disappointed though because after one full year they weren't any bigger than the size of a pencil eraser. It was so slow that this no longer was a, a viable opportunity for growing coral. So I took them off their elevated racks and put them on the base of the aquarium on the bottom thinking that I would just give them some space but not the prime locations and uh, we would just see how they did. And what happened is uh, we went to clean the corals from the aquarium and put them in another aquarium and I went to reach for the one and it stuck so I yanked it and didn't realize it had grown over the back side of the base it was on and attached itself to the coral base bottom of the coral aquarium. And when I did it broke off a piece about the size of my thumbnail and it left behind three little coral polyps by themselves and I thought the parent coral with that big hole in it is going to be very stressed. I'll better watch out for this in case it's not doing well. And the three little polyps left behind had no chance in, of survival in my opinion. That's not what happened. <laughs> what happened was just a couple weeks later I went and looked and picked up the coral that had the big hole in it and it had already repealed and repaired itself that same tissue in two weeks that it took it the size to grow in two years. Wow. And I literally went running back to the old aquarium to see those little polyps and was surprised that they had grown to the size of a nickel or a dime. Went up to 10 or 15 polyps and I cut them each into one more and did the science experiment now of testing one small, we now call it micro fragment, onto each their own base, and it grew up to the same size that it took three years, but it only took three months. Do you experiment with getting like smaller and smaller, and, or is it just literally down to one oh, polyp? We're down to one polyp. We can, uh, really my staff, uh, we have two great scientists here, uh, Chris and Joey, who, who do this on a daily basis, and they're very good at dissecting down all the way down to even one polyp. Wow. 
What's the survival rate when you when you break the polyps down? Do you lose some of the polyps? No, the pretty good, pretty good survival. Um, they, they regularly get uh, ninety percent survival or so, and uh, they can fill a table full of a thousand new corals in just one afternoon. What would you say your biggest limitations are at this point? Uh, like most things, it's uh, space, time, energy, money, <laughs> and uh, we. You know, it took six years to produce 600 corals. We have over 16,000 corals that we fragmented. Probably another 6,000 that we now successfully raised from egg. So uh, really the space and the money is the limit. So if we are able to gain more ground and buy more tanks and get some more assistance, there's no reason that we can't go from 20,000 corals to 200,000, and in four or five years be able to plant one million corals out there. That, that's not just a pie in the sky, it's a reality that could happen in just the next few years. Coral restoration, obviously it's important, why? Oh, most people will ask that question, but I think they, they down deep inside know most of those anyway. And first of all, if you've ever dove down in the Keys, it's it's why everybody comes here. It's a beautiful place to snorkel or scuba dive because the underwater reef is really the oasis of a forest underwater. So less than 1% is coral reefs, but that's where all the animals go to to feed and breed and spend nursery time, is where 25 to 40% of our fisheries is located. If you had a giant desert and a little oasis with a spring, where would all the animals be? In the state of uh, Florida, we have probably a five billion dollar value of our coral reefs. Here in Monroe County, probably close to one billion economically. So economically, it's worth a billion dollars. If you were a billion dollar company, you surely would put one percent of your your value into keeping that business going. So if we had one percent of that billion dollars um, available for coral restoration, we could be taking some of these threatened species off the endangered species list. So what are some of the consequences to us on land here in the Keys to losing the coral reefs beyond just the beauty and the underwater oasis? Most of our houses are just, uh, the land is just two feet above the water. And why is that? The Atlantic Ocean is right here. The Atlantic Ocean uh, two days ago had 10 to 20 foot waves. What happened to those waves? Those waves came in, hit our living barrier reef five miles offshore, and came into shore here as a two inch ripple. If we hadn't had that living reef there, we would have yesterday had 20 foot waves over the top of the, all of the Florida Keys. That's a big deal. If you're gonna own a home, in the Keys if you're going to live here at all. If in the next hundred years we come up one more foot, don't we want our living reef to also grow up one more foot to equal the, the sea level rise? Well, that won't happen if we have a dead reef. Only a living reef will continue to grow up, hopefully uh, equaling uh, what the sea level rise could do. As the reef grows, it's just the top that's alive. That's right. right. It's, it's if, like my hat, if this were a coral, the shape of this, it would only be this top part like the, like the fabric of the hat that is alive, but as it grows it expands and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and what's left behind is calcium carbonate rock. It's what uh, 130,000 years ago uh, we're standing in the Florida Keys of what was our barrier reef. When Restoring the actual corals. How do you how do you attach the corals? We'll take a coral head, like a boulder, like a big rock, and we'll take the corals that were grown on our our plugs, as we call them. And the plug has a little stem on it, just like it was on a small mushroom or similar to a golf tee. And we put a hole in the dead coral rock of a brain coral, and then we insert the living plugs onto that so that just as if you were plugging a, a yard for a new lawn, you have choices. You could throw seed out there and hope it grows. 
you could sod the whole thing solid, or you could put little plugs in every foot and wait a year or two for it to grow. That's what we're doing. We're plugging little pieces of live coral so that in a year or two, it will merge into one big coral lawn. Dave, how many species of coral are you regrowing here in your facility? Uh, we have 28 species, uh, more or less, of hard corals in the Florida Keys. Uh, we have them all in here in captivity, just to make sure we have a gene bank of living tissue. But it, there's the top 12 that is mostly found in the larger number. Just as if you were going through an oak and a maple and a pine forest, there's major species we are mainly doing the brain coral, the boulder coral, uh, the mountain coral, the star coral, but also the uh, staghorn and elkhorn coral. We started, and most people start with, with uh, coral restoration with the staghorn coral. And it's called staghorn because it really looks like a deer's antlers. And it is a fast growing coral. We start with a piece about this big, something like the size of your small finger. And uh, in one year, it will produce three or four branches and look the size and shape of your hand with three or four branches each three or four inches long. And most people have seen these reef building corals just as looking like big rocks, some the size of a Volkswagen, and not realize that some of those corals are 100, 200, 300 or more years old and they're very slow growing, which is why everybody else did not want to work with those corals. In fact, I sort of coined them the orphan corals. Dave was telling me earlier that he is going to retire after he plants a million coral, and we should see what are some ways that we can speed that along. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one of those pills so I uh, live for another hundred years. <laughs> no, really, uh, um, I'm 62 years old now, so it's, I don't say that lightly that uh, I want to plant a million corals before I retire. But like any business or like any operation, um, uh, it takes some space, it takes some energy in the form of labor of people, and uh, it takes a little bit of money support. Uh, our first corals 10 years ago cost us close to $1,000 a coral because of only producing so few. Then just uh, five years ago, it was under $100 a coral, and now is well under $25 a coral, and I expect it to be $10 a coral, the cost. So for $10 million, we can actually plant a million corals that funds and supports a one billion dollar a year industry in, in the Florida Keys alone. When I grew up I actually thought I wanted to be a park ranger because I learned that you could have a job protecting some of the above ground forests or you could learn how to manage a forest. Now today kids have the opportunity to be an underwater park ranger. We really need protected areas, we need managers, we need underwater ecologists, biologists, and we need coral restoration biologists to aquaculture corals and plant them out and monitor them. I think there's a wonderful career ahead for the kids of tomorrow. Zach Moses with HE Travel. I'm talking with Dave Vaughn of the Moat Marine Laboratory. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. All right. Well, this new lab will be a uh, literally a center for coral reef research for restoration technologies and we hope to uh, uh, host scientists from around the world.